Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the studio for more advanced casting. Last time we worked on the inside of the molds, we finished all the work that had to go on in there, which is a lot when we use open mold casting techniques. Then we closed the molds, we joined the halves from the inside and let them sit overnight. And today we're going to begin by opening the molds, so let's get into it. Mold making and casting are the aspects of sculpture that I would consider purely technical. There's little to no artistry going on here. Right now, opening molds, there is probably very little technical skill required either, to be honest. Frankly, this is the simplest and probably the easiest task we have to accomplish this entire series. It's always a little scary to open molds because you don't know if everything went according to plan or not. The result is always a little disappointing, I find, as well, at least it is for me, because there is always more work to be done to the cast once it's outside the mold. It never seems to come out perfect, which, of course, is probably my fault. Unscrewing the multiple pieces of model mold from each other makes the molding very, very easy. And the wing nuts make it a toolless thing as well, which is nice. The price we perhaps paid in time and effort when making the mold now comes back as a massive benefit. Some of these model mold pieces don't even need to be completely unscrewed from each other. Simply by loosening the screws and then using a screwdriver in between where the model molds meet, I can wiggle most of them loose from the silicone skin. This kind of tells me that some of the model molds were perhaps a little bit overbuilt. I made too many pieces, but I have no issue with this. I'd rather overbuild a mold and make it too good and therefore very easy to take off the silicone compared to the opposite happening and destroying a cast trying to get it out of a mold because the model mold is stuck or, or something similar like that. Once the model mold pieces are removed, I make sure to have something soft and clean laying on the table to protect the silicone, so that I can lay the silicone down on it. My table at the moment is full of shards of dried resin and dust, and I don't want to accidentally cut or mess up my silicone. I'm just using some soft foam, some soft packing foam that came with a package or something here, to, to lay the piece down on. A pillow will work just fine as well, but perhaps don't use the pillow to sleep on in the future. To avoid ripping and tearing of the silicone, I'm always working it loose from the edges first and I will always take my time when doing this. Rushing will only cause problems here, that's for sure. There will be some suction between the silicone and the resin cast inside and we have to release some of the suction before we can safely remove the silicone skin. I'll usually work from the bottom upwards, but sometimes it can be useful to consider what the cast looks like underneath the silicone as well. When removing silicone from a face, for example, I really prefer to pull the silicone down from the top of the head and down towards the chin. And the reason for this is so that the silicone doesn't get stuck inside the nose or nostrils or inside the cavities of the eye sockets. Pulling up could mean ripping the nostrils off, breaking something if the silicone skin goes too deep into the nostrils. Pulling the skin down just makes sure that this is never an issue. While really not an issue here, since the ears are covered with hair, it's always smart to pull the silicone skin from behind the ears carefully and try to lift it up and over the ears. Ears will often tend to get stuck and caught and, and snap off because they have so much detail and so many deep crevices. If the ears stick out far from the head, the silicone skin can get caught behind the ears as well, so that's where the lifting the silicone off the surface is going to help you out. I prefer, if I have ears on my sculpture, to place the seam line where the two silicone pieces meet, either in front or behind the ears. Never right through the ears, and I'll rarely try to perfectly place the seam line on the edge of the ears as well. That's a little bit too risky for me. 
If there is some distortion in the casting process and the ears expand and become wider, for example, because you couldn't close the seam that went through the ear properly, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb in your casting. One ear will be much larger than the other. Repairing seams inside the complex shape of the ear is also a nightmare, so we try to avoid that if possible. Now, if some distortion did happen and the seam line is placed in front or behind the ear, then that distortion takes place in the skull or along the hair, and it's much less likely that it will be noticed by anyone. Taking care of the mold is essential, since it's the only thing now that keeps your clay sculpture alive. The model mold is tough, and unless you throw it around, it will stay alive on its own, pretty much. Silicone is, however, a little bit more fragile and requires a little more delicacy. As you saw, I don't let the silicone lay on a dirty surface, and I also make sure that right after the molding, right after the silicone goes off the, silic goes off the, uh, the casting, that is, I put it back into the model mold right away. It can be easy when the molding your sculpture to forget to put the model mold pieces back together, before taking the silicone skin off, but I would suggest you hold your horses, temper that excitement a little bit to see your piece again, and make sure that the model mold is reassembled so that the silicone skin can be put back into its place right away. Silicone skins left sitting out with no support can deform if left long enough, and at that point your mold won't be representing your sculpture anymore, but instead represent some sort of strange and deformed version of your sculpture, which of course would be a terrible thing to have happen. Since we cast our sculpture in multiple pieces using multiple molds, we have to demold them all before beginning the next step. I do prefer to work in this sort of a assembly line style, if you will, do one step completely everywhere with every piece before moving on to the next step. This helps keep me organized and I don't lose track of what's going on or I have to redo my setup all the time because it's not conducive to what I'm trying to do in a particular moment. So do the entirety of a step at a time to be more effective. With the base and with some of the other pieces that I've cast, there is only one model mold piece for one piece of silicone. And this is when things can get a little bit tricky when using resin model molds. With multiple model mold pieces for one silicone piece, you can pry against something hard when getting the first piece of model mold off. You can pry against the other model mold piece that's there. This helps tremendously. And you can't do that if there's only one model mold piece for the silicone half. And so that requires a little bit more finesse. Silicone is pretty strong, but it can be damaged by a rogue agent with a screwdriver, let's say. So make sure to be careful if you plan on using something like a flathead screwdriver to pry against the silicone with, to get the mold mold off. You can also damage the cast within if you're not careful. Bigger mold molds will cause more issues than smaller ones. I'm not entirely sure why this is the case, but I do believe that it's because the amount of suction present in a piece with a larger surface area is going to be greater than in one that's smaller. Always inspect the piece that comes out of the mold, see if there's any defects, check if you need to recast the piece or if it can be reworked and patched up. Usually there will be some defects when casting using this method and these kinds of molds. But these can usually be fixed pretty easily, as you'll see soon enough. Only experience can sort of teach you what can be fixed and what can't be fixed. You sort of just have to try fixing everything and seeing how it goes before you, before you learn when it's time to recast.